So welcome on this beautiful fall afternoon. We appreciate you all joining us. Um, my name is Michelle Gallagher-Roberts and I'm the acting director here. We are thrilled to host this panel discussion and book signing for In a Modern Rendering, The Color Woodcuts of Gustav Bauman, A Catalog Raisonne. This labor of love by Anne Bauman and Gayla Chamberlain has been 30 years in the making. Unfortunately, Anne Bauman was unable to see this amazing legacy of her father's work come to fruition. Gayla just mentioned that actually yesterday was the anniversary of Anne's death, so it's kind of fitting that we're all here today. Um, but before her passing, she made sure this work was in good hands with Gayla. The New Mexico Museum of Art has been lucky enough to be on this journey with Gayla and her co-authors, not for 30 years, but for a big portion of it. Um, with over 1,700 works in our collection, we are the largest repository of Bauman's artwork in the world. Gus, Jane, and Anne have been beloved figures in Santa Fe for over 100 years. Many people in the community have still reminisce about attending puppet shows in their living room when they were young. This tradition continues with the museum's annual holiday open house in December, where replicas of Bauman's marionettes from our collection are put on, dis put on a play inspired by Gus. Today, we gather to celebrate the artistic creativity of Gustav Bauman and the dogged determination and hard work of these talented authors. It is my pleasure to introduce Kate Nelson, moderator of today's panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today, and I'm going to introduce our guests, not quite in order of how they're seated here. I had it all different in my head. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah! Let me sing something first. <laughs> um, and I, I asked them ahead of time that as I introduce them, I'd like them each to share a short story of how they first became aware of Gustav Bauman and where the enchantment with him began. And I'm going to start with Gayla Chamberlain. She's the guardian angel of all things Gustav Bauman for decades. Annex Galleries, which she owns with her husband, has represented Bauman, and during that time, they became friends with Anne Bauman, the only child of Gus and Jane. And Anne benighted Gayla to carry on as the estate's trustee after her death in 2011. Even before then, she began working on this catalog raisonné which uh, th this project included transcribing every single one of Gustav Bauman's papers. Um, if there are any grad students in the audience, she feels your pain. Um, <laughs> through Gayla Chamberlain, the Ann Bauman Trust has helped fund the publication of this book, uh, the Artist Cards from Holidays Past book, which everybody adores, uh, an exhibition, Gustav Bauman in California, and the 2018 Bauman Symposium. Who was at that symposium? Wonderful turnout for that. <laughs> you were all there too. Gayla, this is Gayla Chamberlain. Share some stories about uh, how you fell in love with Gustav Bauman. Well, I first began working at the Annex Galleries in 1977. And really at that time, I didn't know a thing about printmaking. So I was slowly learning the difference between an etching and a dry point. And then he had this body of work that was so full of color. And it was Bauman's color woodcuts. And they were of areas that I had never been to be yet, except for, of course, the California coastline. But there were scenes of Provincetown. And I hadn't yet been to New York City and uh, or even to Santa Fe. So the scenes were magical to me. And I, I don't know, I was just captured by them. I was selling them. And I was then. Years later, helping Dan put together exhibitions that traveled. And I would put the shows together. And it was magical to, to struggle with putting 30 prints together that would represent his body of work and tell his story. So it was a, a fast, long process at the same time. Wonderful. Nancy, you're going to be next. 
Nancy E. Green is a star curator at the Herbert F. Johnson Museum at Cornell University. Her essay on Bauman in this book is required reading for anyone who wants to know his life story. She's written a number of award-winning publications, many of them focused on arts and crafts era artists, and is currently working on an exhibition that examines the revolution in teaching art at the turn of the last century. Tell us your Baumania story. <laughs> Well, when you told me last night that this was going to be the question, I thought, I don't remember not knowing that one. <laughs> so when was that magic moment? Um, I think it was when I started work at Cornell, which was 35 years ago, and I was looking through the collections, which are quite extensive, but there was one donor to the, to the collection. His na name was William Chapman. He was the, the class of 1882. And he collected all prints, 3,000 prints, which he gave to our, our, our institution. And in that was a group of Bauman prints. And who knew? He was buying by his works by his contemporaries. And he was also buying Durer and Rembrandt and Whistler. And I thought, this is the place I want to be. And so I got interested in color woodcuts. And when I saw his work, like Gayla, it was the color and also the complexity. I mean, if you look at the complexity of his woodcuts, it's, he's so much far above any other woodcut artist. So it was, you know, it was love at first sight. <laughs> what can I say? Thank you, Nancy. Thomas Leach fairly embodies Gustav Bauman right down to the round eyeglasses. As director of the Palace Press at the Palace of the Governors, he excels in many of the same book arts as Bauman did and has received the Mayor's Award for Excellence in the Arts. The Palace Press received the Carl Herzog Award for Excellence in Book Design and among book designers, that's huge and the Edgar Lee Hewitt Award from the New Mexico Association of Museums. He co-authored the book, Gustav Bauman and Friends, Artist Cards from Holidays Past with Jean Moss, who's in the front row. Perhaps most significantly, he is the only person to be granted the privilege of printing from the master's blocks by the Bauman Trust. And what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> when you became aware of Bauman and how that enchantment okay. took root? Well, um, I would say back in the 80s, it could have even been the 70s, oh, back in the 80s or the 70s, uh, I was working in commercial printing up in Colorado Springs, and um, we were a pretty high-tech shop, high-speed, uh, multicolor presses. And so I thought I knew a lot about printing, and I came down to Santa Fe and um, was probably in the museum shop where they were selling uh, Gustav Bauman prints for $100, something like that, which I couldn't afford, but I saw those and I thought, how did he do that? And so I was always intrigued by his way of printing versus what everyone else thought of standard printing. Um, and the name stuck with me when Hands of a Craftsman came out. Um, I asked for that for Christmas, and my 10-year-old son bought it for me, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Uh, Martin Krauss has logged 39 years as the curator of prints, drawings, and photographs at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Those who love Bauman know that Indiana is an epicenter of Gus Love. Martin's museum was the early institutional collector of Bauman and has the second largest collection of Bauman's works. He has written or edited three books about Bauman. Tell us about the roots of that love. Well, Kate, I, I remember very specifically my introduction to Gus Bauman. Uh, in 1979, I was hired out of the paintings department at the uh, Indianapolis Museum of Art to uh, become the print curator because I was cheaper, oh sorry, I was cheaper than hiring somebody who really knew anything about prints. So my introduction to printmaking really came from the matter framer uh, in the department and she was a printmaker and she introduced me to Bauman's work because we had a couple of dozen Bauman prints mostly dating from his years spent in southern Indiana in Brown County from 1910 to 1916, which the museum had acquired from Bauman just after he arrived in Santa Fe, uh, so in, in 1919. And I had never seen his work before. I had never heard his name before. And I was just knocked out by his work. So a year later or so, I got a letter from the Annex Gallery 
which they sent to, I think, all museums, offering a traveling show of Bauman's work. Uh, and you could get it in a, uh, either a version with 30 prints or a version with 60 prints. And I thought, well, for Bauman's centennial, which would have been in 1981, the centennial of his birth, why not put together an exhibition that would include prints from the estate of the artist and combined with what the museum had. So I called the Annex Gallery, and I'm pretty sure I talked to Gala, who I didn't know, but I think she answered the phone. But at any rate, we arranged for the borrowing of this exhibition, which, as I remember, cost nothing. But Dan tells me it was $100 <laughs> was the rental fee. <laughs> and they crated them up and put them on a Greyhound bus. And we went down to the depot and picked them up, which was an unorthodox <laughs> way of shipping an <laughs> exhibition, even in 1981. <laughs> Uh, so we put on this show, and because Anne supported everything related to Bauman, Anne Bauman, she came to our little in-house opening, as did Bauman's sister, uh, Lottie, who lived in Columbus, Ohio, when she brought her extended family. So that was my introduction to Anne, uh, who I you know, was close to ever thereafter. And then at the end of the show, Dan and I think Gala came to pick up the exhibition and put it in the back of their VW van or wherever it was. Uh, so that was the first time I had met them. So that's really the, be, the genesis of, of, you know, sort of my lifelong interest in the work of Gus Bauman. And as I told the audience last year, it should be Gustav. At least that's what Ann always called him. And we all call him Gustav, but Gustav would be the preferred pronunciation. So if you want to really show that you're in the know with Bauman folk, pronounce it Gus or Gustav. Okay, on three, two, one, we're all going to practice it. Three, two, one, <laughs> Gustav. Gustav. <laughs> David Skolkin is the guy you want designing your book, whether he's doing it in his role as art and production director at the Museum of New Mexico Press or at Radius Books, which he co-founded here in Santa Fe. He has gained a reputation for elegance and inventiveness in his book and graphic design. He works for clients all over the country and even does extensive on-site supervision in Europe and Asia to make sure they're doing it the way he wanted it done. We stole him away from New York City and we're not giving him back. <laughs> talk, to, talk to us about your Gustav. That's Gustav quite a, an introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Really, really nice to have this celebration uh, for this book, which was an incredible uh, adventure. Um, my story is really simple. I didn't know about Bauman in New York. Um, I moved out here and I just started seeing lots of calendars and postcards. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. And I kept on seeing his imagery um, in very commercial stuff and sort of everywhere. And, and I still didn't really take notice. Um, I, I liked the work, but you know, I didn't think about it too much. I then designed Hand of a Craftsman at the museum. And so that's when, I guess, my first real introduction to his work. But even then, I, um, I can't say that I was fully engaged in it or, or really understood it. And maybe that's a better way of saying it. I think I really fell in love with his work when I was printing this, first of all, doing this book and what I learned about him in the doing of it. But honestly, when I was on press in Italy printing this book a few months ago, um, when we were standing there, as the sheets were coming off the press. And I'm around with all these Italians, they had no idea who this guy was. And we were looking at this work, and I'm telling you, it was like a, this unbelievable revelation and how incredible this work was. And they all started getting really excited and like, oh my God, and how did he do this? And how did he do this? And look at these colors. And I think that, so very recently for me, I realized how incredible this man is. Thank you, David. Um, we also have an unseen guest on the panel, and, and that's Rizzoli. Since 1974, this publisher has committed itself to crafting books about art, history, and culture that are both wise and beautiful. Um, in an era that only seems tilted toward desktop publishing and web-only storytelling, Rizzoli asserts for all of us who love books that print is not dead. 
Put a round of applause for Rizzoli. I, I show them, I show this book, no disrespect by setting it here, but you, you need to see it, and I don't want it to block their heads. This is the book. The, um, the December issue of New Mexico Magazine, which I have a little something to do with, has, it should be in your mailboxes now because you're all subscribers. And it's our, it's our gift guide issue, and the number one book we recommend buying is, is this one. Um, for anyone in your life who loves Gus, Gustav Bauman, <laughs> it's an extraordinary present. I'm also thinking it would make an incredible donation to a library where future students of art history and printmaking process can, can learn from authors who, who have done yeoman's work on this. Gayla, let's open this with you, um, and, and then all of you might well have reason to, to weigh in on it. You had this mass of info. <laughs> um, there's something like, what, 429 prints in the book? Well, there's 180 edition prints, and then there's this huge body of ephemera, so. How does one go about organizing all of that and figuring out how you're going to present it? I did it in Word. <laughs> and I had them yes, as... Yes, Word! I had them as separate documents for years. And as I was uh, constantly changing dates on things, as I found more information. And finally someone came in and said, you should link those all together, which I'm not sure was the, the best thing to do because I was still then having to shift everything up and shift everything down. But it was really in Word that I began. And then I had binders. I have binders yet all over my house. I have stacks of discs this high because every time I change anything, I, I made a copy of it. Uh, I don't really know other than it was just, I guess, tenacity. I just kept at it to get it done. I'm glad you backed up your data. Nancy, how about you? You had to synthesize his entire life into an article. And there are missing bits. <laughs> the, the, the juicy parts. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, well, I think I have to thank Gus, because he wrote so much himself. And that was, and, um, and actually you compiled the autobiography. Um, last year, two years ago? Uh, 2015. Okay, a while ago. <laughs> but, um, Seems like it, but there was, there was so much information from him. The only thing that was a little iffy were the dates. He was a little fuzzy about the dates. So, there, so that, was, that was something that actually we went back and forth on, some of the dates of where he was when. But um, I just found him such a fascinating character and such an interesting person. And um, I just, um, I was, the day that Gayla asked me to work on this project was just an incredible day for me because I've always loved his work, or as long as I can remember. And um, the idea of being able to put his life in context for this great project, just I, I found it so exciting. So it was, it was I, I learned so much about him. I learned so much about his process. And I learned about him in terms of other woodcut artists, which I've done a lot of work on other woodcut artists. And it just kind of opened up this whole world to me. So it was just, it was, Fun. It was really fun. The essay does um, <laughs> dwell a lot on his development as an artist, as a mm -hmm. young man when he's not producing the things that we all love him for. Why was it important to you to, to connote all those parts? Well, because I think, you know, like all of us, we have different sections of our lives, and to make to really see the whole Gustav Bauman, you had to look at every single step of his of his learning in his career. And um, I'm from upstate New York, so I was intrigued by Wyoming, New York. I didn't even know there was a Wyoming, New York until I started working on Bauman. And he was there for a short period of time, but he made some beautiful prints there. So I think that that giving that that um, that history and, and getting to know him as a person really tells you a lot about the way he made prints and, how, and um, how dedicated he was to his printmaking and how important it was to make the perfect print. And so that just fascinated me. So the whole process was wonderful. Marty, I'll throw this at you first. Um, uh, Bauman's work is, is, is beautiful and it imparts a sense of nostalgia and it continues to sell today. What is it, what is it, what is in it that calls for scholarly assessment today, continued scholarly assessment? 
Well, as most curators answer every question, there are really two answers to that uh, question. One is that he's really part of an era, uh, sort of the revival of color woodblock printmaking during the late 19th and early 20th century, sort of during the heyday of the arts and crafts movement. Though he alone really continued throughout his career to produce color woodblock prints, and one has to imagine that they were looked on as a little passe when you get to the 1950s, um, because his prices, if you look at price lists from the 1950s, $35 a print, $50 a print, they're really the same as they had been in the 30s. So there, there was a sort of a leveling off. And, and the other answer to that question is that he is unique. There is absolutely nobody who imitates him or is he imitative of. And I think that's basically because he was self-taught. Outside of 18 months at the Kunstgewerbeschule, <laughs> in, I'm, I'm teaching Gela how to say Kunstgewerbeschule, uh, which is the arts and crafts school in Munich, uh, where he was really more interested in toy making than he was in uh, block printing, but he took a course in, in block printing or linocut printing. Uh, so that was really his only instruction in the medium. The rest of it was developed using his own work ethic, which comes really out of his childhood because at the age of 16, his father left the family in Chicago and he was the eldest child and he went to work to support the family in an engraving house. So his life was really self-made. He's really the sort of quintessence of a self-made individual and he follows his own path. He really never, there is a, a sort of a linear trajectory in his work that really doesn't veer off as if he's influenced by somebody else. So that makes him fascinating in, as an historical study. Tom, um, you are, I mean, your hands-on knowledge of his process is probably greater than anyone on the face of the earth. How's that? Um, um, and the inscrutability of it. I know there, you're, there's still questions of it that, that you puzzle over. Um, you talk in your essay about the sensitivity of the press, how even putting a piece of tissue paper underneath the type will affect how the ink alchemizes with the paper. And knowing that Bauman was aware of all those details, how does that affect you when you sit down to write about him? Well, those were the things that I really wanted to talk about because I've read lots of manuals on how to make a woodcut. And there are always things left out. You mm -hmm. know, um, It's the basic stuff, which Gus boiled down to at one point in his career is, um, carve away everything you don't want and then print it and then you have a print, you know. Um, <laughs> and it, 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 it's not that far removed from that, but there's just this myriad of small details that I know I have to deal with all the time and I just wanted people to know what that's like. Um, Is it scary? Um, I mean, if, as if you're, I'm printing as you're a Bauman block, him. it's scary as hell. But <laughs> if it's my own block, it's no. It's like, well, let's try this, let's try that. Um, it's, it is trial and error. Mm -hmm. it's, um, but it can go on for hours until you get what you want. It's not, so many people think of printing as just either you push a button or you pull a crank and it's done. But he was tuned in to every print that he made. Let's, let's move back into the, this process of writing the book and the masses of, of information, which eventually gets dumped onto a book designer who has to figure out how to make it all beautiful. Let's talk about how you break it down. How I break it down. Um, it's a challenge. Um, I think Tom pointed Gail in my direction, and when we first met, um, I was so unbelievably excited about the prospect of, of doing the book. Um, but we had some challenges. We had to find a publisher for it. We had to talk about how we were gonna do it and, and schedules and all this kind of stuff. And I was very excited and, and so I took it on you know, with great gusto. And um, then when it, the dust settled, I said, holy, you know, how am I gonna do this? <laughs> um, 
I had been working with Rizzoli on a lot of other projects, so luckily I was able to pick up a phone and I spoke to Margaret Chase. It's really great that you gave them some acknowledgement, by the way, because they had a lot to do with why this book is so great. Um, I called Margaret Chase, a publisher there, associate publisher there, and she immediately, she goes, I love Bauman. And you know, it was very soon thereafter, she said, I'm in. And then we all met in New York and um, sort of got that process going uh, with her. And then Gail and I, over the course of two years, um, just started go going through the material. We had a, a basic design that was done uh, for some of the pages by a talented designer in California named Leslie Fitch. And we looked at that and I sort of adapted that and, and revised it. And um, over the course of about a year and a half, we just started putting it together. And um, a catalog resume is a very special kind of book. It's not like a regular monograph or other kinds of art books. It's really informational. It has to really be easy to use. It has to be legible. It has to be um, you know, inclusive in terms of what scholars are gonna want from it. So that also um, has some very specific um, strategies around it in terms of how you design it and how you put it together. Um, and so I guess we just sort of did it. That's terrific. It, it, I, I've been through the whole thing, and it is remarkably easy to read. It's dense, and that's what it's supposed to be. The annotation, man, you did, you went to town. <laughs> <laughs> In that creative process, um, disagreements are bound to erupt. Gayla, why don't you talk to us about what some of the impediments were, what some of the disagreements might have been, and how they worked their way out. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Do we have to go back into ancient history? <laughs> um, I think finding the right people at the right time was amazing for me. I mean, I did not know how to put this book together. And so I found Leslie Fitch by chance through asking a book designer who was actually working on it with another curator who dropped out. And then Leslie said to me one day, you need to have this edited. You're right, where do I go? She sent me to someone in Seattle who then said, I don't do this, you need to talk to, to Francis Bowles in Arinda, who is it's basically in my backyard. And it turns out that Francis Bowles works solely on catalog resumes. So that was amazing to get Nancy on board and Tom on board and David on board and Martin. It was just amazing. It was like someone was guiding. I can't think of too many really awful problems that we came up with. Um, Anne was the amazing person behind the book because she wanted a book on her DAW, and that was almost like her reason for being at the end of her life, and so she set up her trust to fund it, so that was easy. Um, and it's not always easy, that part. Yeah. It's yeah, a to, fantasy to be saying, let's do what we need to do. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, no, but no, no, it's no. a very important point. Not only does this incredible book come to us, but Gaila says, we have to do this the absolutely best way we can. And maybe some of the, some of the problems we ran into is I had to convince Rizzoli about the production guidelines that I wanted. And it was a lot of conversations. I wanted to print with a very specific printer in Italy. I wanted, I wanted to work with a very specific pre-press person out of Chicago. I knew exactly how this book needed to be done because Gala really gave me those marching orders. So some of the resistance that we hit, and it wasn't too much, was convincing Rizzoli that this is what really needed to happen. Because they're like, oh my God, the expense and the this and the that. And, and you know, that printer, they're really small and you have to schedule them a year in advance and they're hard to work with. I said, I don't care, I don't care. This is the way this book needs to be done. And Gala was incredible in her unending support of me and what I was trying to do. 
And she said, yes. You know, she was always saying, yes, 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 yes. So it really was incredible. I think we came up with that sort of jointly. I, I can't really remember. Well, you know that, that Bauman designed those. Those are Bauman end papers. You know, he did some book design, as probably a lot of you know. He did some books, and we pulled. These are actually end sheets that he designed. Nice. May I add something to what you were just talking about? One other element of the book that is so outstanding is the photography of some of these prints. And many of them were taken by Blair Clark, sitting yes. right there, who has, <laughs> over the years, photographed just about every artifact in the Museum of New Mexico, but also many of the Bauman prints. So those calendars and cards that you spoke about, Blair Clark photography. So I just wanted to put that in. This question, I'm throwing it up as a jump ball, so whoever wants to grab it first can, but I'd love to hear from everyone on it. Within your career work on Bauman, you've each in different ways had to be something of a detective and along the way made discoveries. And whether they were discoveries that helped you with what you did for this book or just in your scholarship about Bauman, um, I'd like to hear some tale telling. Maybe even something about a swimming pool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll jump into the swimming pool on that one. Um, a phone call came one Saturday morning. Um, a number of years ago. Um, it was actually from our friend Will Roth, who unfortunately left us um, just in this last week. But Will called and um, said, Tom, I've got a wooden crate with Gus Bauman's name on it. Do you want it? And I said, I'll be right there. And uh, I got there, and sure enough, a great big wooden crate. And he was giving it to someone else. It had been in his garage for years and um, they were putting it in someone's truck and they turned it over and there was Bauman's name and address on the crate and that's why he called me and I said, where did this come from? He said, well, I've had it for years but there's a house around the corner with a swimming pool full of Bauman stuff. <laughs> what? And so this, the story is that um, after, after Gus died, Jane gave the contents of the studio to Helen Gentry, who was a noted printer and publisher who had moved to Santa Fe. And when Helen died, her nieces on her property had a uh, swimming pool, so they just put everything in the swimming pool, put a roof on top, and knocked a door in the side. And I've said this often, but I was looking for a part of the press. The museum had already acquired the press, but it was missing a part that I knew he needed. And I was hoping I would find that part in the swimming pool. And so when we go in there, not only did we find that, but we found his pigments, his hand tools, other things that he had built. Um, all the things that appeared in a photograph that we had of his studio, and it dawned on me that we could actually recreate the studio in, in the print shop at the Palace of the Governors, which we have. So that was surprising. <laughs> I'll jump in about Anne's. Well, for research, I wish the internet had been there from the very beginning, but Anne Bauman lived in Santa Rosa, and in 1996, she invited me to her home to work one day a week. But everything I asked her for, she didn't have. She didn't have printing records, consignment records, sales records, no, no, no. But she would bring things down this long hallway to me to work on every Monday. So it was always Mondays with Anne. But around the room were these very acidic cardboard boxes that had really interesting letters. So when I finished with what she brought me that day, I would poke through and I realized, oh, there's a letter from Booker T. Washington and a letter from John D. Rockefeller. So I said to her, Anne, we need to archive these. Let's get serious. If this is your dad's archive, let's get these in archival sleeves. So we started ordering. And then one day I got to her house and she was on a walker. And I had known her for 20 some years by that point. So I challenged her. 
to basically say the project will end because you can't carry anything to me unless I can get in the back room, which you don't want me to see. So if it's housekeeping, I can vacuum and dust. Boom, the door opened. <laughs> and it was just chaotic wonder. And it was like going layer after layer through it. But she did have consignment records and printing records. And uh, it was just a wonderland in there. It changed everything I knew about him. Everything I had written, I had to just redo based on what I had there. And it took a long time to read it, go through it, and, and figure it out. Uh, so th that was like a big archaeological dig for me. It was great. <laughs> When I was working on editing the, his autobiography, uh, and as Nancy said, I knew that his writing was fairly anecdotal and conversational, and that dates, which he usually avoided totally, but when they were there, they were pretty unreliable. So I thought for the annotations of his writing, I would go back to as many primary sources as I could. So I read every copy of the Santa Fe New Mexican from 1918 until 1971, which in the early years wasn't that hard because it was like only five pages long. And because Santa Fe only had 5,000 people in 1918, it reported on everything that was going on. And a couple of stories that I remember, in 1921, Bauman went to Albuquerque and he bought a Chevrolet because the distances here were so great that unlike Indiana where he could walk the four miles to everything he wanted to sketch, here it was 500 miles. So he bought an automobile and he didn't know how to drive and yet he drove it home from Albuquerque. <laughs> And he writes a story about this where he breaks down about halfway between Albuquerque and, and Santa Fe. And I don't know how he found a phone, but he called a garage which was on the plaza and they came and towed him unceremoniously into town. And then the Santa Fe New Mexican reported that he spent the summer learning how to drive in town and they kept reporting on his mishaps running over <laughs> parked bicycles on the plaza as he jumped the curb. And uh, so all of this sort of very human uh, uh, material really came out of these newspapers, which was, you know, gave sort of a third party uh, sort of viewpoint on, uh, on his work. And I remember very specifically in 1926, and I can't remember the date, but in the personnel or personal column in where the sort of goings of the locals were reported, it said, Gus Bauman is homesick today. <laughs> I don't have anything nearly as exciting as either any of these stories. <laughs> but I will say that um, the letters have been fascinating reading. And I, I, I wish that we could have re reproduced all of those in the catalog, too, because um, he corresponded with so many important people in his, in his lifetime. And I was really fascinated by his correspondence with Dart Hunter, who is the paper maker, and I mean, uh, um, the guru of, of paper making, and, and back and forth and back and forth of what papers to use and what not to use. And, and I just found that correspondence really fascinating. But he also corresponded with a lot of artists. And then um, there were the letters that Jane wrote, and Jane wrote letters to friends, and you got a different kind of idea of what Gus was like to live with. And um, some days, maybe not so good. But, <laughs> but I think that those letters, the, that, that firsthand information gave, gave me such a broader idea of what he was like as a person, and made me understand more about, about you know, once you know something more about the person, you could then start looking at the art differently. And it makes you appreciate it in a different way. And, and those, the, that archive is so important, and I'm so glad that Anne finally let you see them. <laughs> 
handwritten letters and newspapers. What will future <laughs> artists be known by? Um, designers have to be detectives too. You have to understand the context, the content, and everything very intimately. What was an aha moment for you in your process? Hmm. Uh, there were a lot of aha moments. Um, I didn't have a relationship with him like these people so luckily did. So for me, my relationship really began when I started working on this book. Um, and what, the interesting thing that happens, especially when it's a two plus year um, experience is you sort of start feeling like he sort of is in my body, you know, I really, I'm, I'm living with this work every day and I'm reading these wonderful words these people are writing about him. So um, I think um, my experience of him really came through being really close to all of that. Um, one funny thing for me that I was going to say when these guys were talking about these funny stories and in my relationship with with the book, which is really my relationship with him, um, was calling Rizzoli every week for a while and, and, and like going, I need 16 more pages. Yeah. <laughs> I need 16 more pages. I think I need 32 more pages. Um, and there were really lots of moments, I'm not sure this is answering your question, in this book where I really did feel he was sort of right there with me. Um, there are some changes that he forced me to make in my life that I had to make um, and which were really good to make and the definitely a result of this book. Um, there were lots of quirky things that happened around the book, around deliveries, around all sorts of funny stuff. Um, but anyway, I'm not sure that answers your question, but that was sort of my, my experience of him. Having written a book, I know the experience of walking with someone for a long period and then getting it done and wondering, oh, now who am I going to talk to in my head every day? Leave me alone. Nancy, you make a point, um, uh, or you, you tell a vignette in your, in your essay about um, Gustav being a, 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 an art student, I believe in Germany, mm -hmm. and he's working in his studio late at night. He's the only one left, and the professor looks over his shoulder and sort of harumps at him and says, you'd learn more at the local pub or the coffee shop. Coffee shop. And, and he leaves, he, and he goes to the coffee shop and finds the conviviality, the collegiality, and this, this foment of ideas, um, and his art begins to change. Is that why he was such a social being throughout the rest of his life, and whether that was the root cause or not? How did being a social butterfly, in some ways, affect him as an artist? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because um, I'm not absolutely sure he was much of a social butterfly. I, I associate that with Jane, his wife. She, mm. um, you know, she had been trained as an actress and a singer, and I think she loved dressing up and being part of the, the puppet theater. And I think, I think, Gustav. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think, I think he, you know, I, I think that anecdote was is is very telling because he had to be forced to go out and True. and and play with people. Um, I don't think it came naturally to him. I think part of that was was as Marty was saying, he was a res he was responsible for his family at the age of sixteen. He you know he was a very hard worker. I think he devoted most of his time before he met Jane really to um, to his art. And I think he I think it was hard for him to loosen up. I think he liked some of the celebrations that happened here in town. Um, and he certainly participated in them. But I think Jane might have been the little the push to like, let's go let's go to this event. Let's let's have a party. Let's do this. So I think I think that he was in you know, I think it was hard for him to leave his work and just put that aside and, and, and have fun. Oh, that's really interesting. In, in leaving his work, yeah. he's in this fascinating time of Santa Fe history. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an artist around right. every corner. Right. And is that interaction then affecting what he's doing back in his own studio? I, I, I think he's a one-off. 
<laughs> I, I think he. I think he's a one-off. I think he really, and I think that was the other thing too, is that he. He was. He had his own ideas. I, I think he admired and he appreciated other artists, but I don't think he really took much away from them. I think, or fr from them. I don't think he took much from them. I think he was, as Marty was saying, he was a very individual artist, and he, that was what he did his entire life. Mm. So I think that was that was him. That was what Bauman was. A little, I think that I hadn't really thought about. But throughout his career, at least early career, he was attracted to art colonies, but ultimately was disappointed and left because of the politics in among sort of the artists. I mean, that happened in, in uh, Taos, that happened in Brown County. Uh, that, you know, he always said that these art colonies carry the germ of their own destruction in them because artists discover a pristine place and by publicizing it, it's no longer pristine. Uh, so the real estate developers show up and sell off the landscape. So, uh, so I think in, in many ways, I, I, I think Nancy is correct that innately he was sort of a loner. I think, you know, he, he enjoyed company. I mean, you know, he would participate in these things, but I think, in, and I think he was a good fellow. I think everybody thought he was a good chap. But, uh, but I think that his real motivation was his work. And that's where he probably expended most of his energy. I'm, the stories that I've heard is that, I mean, in his studio, that was his space. I mean, that's where he lived and thought and, you know, often late into the middle of the night and no one got into the studio or almost no one. But then he had this other side that he was um, amazingly generous and civic minded. So he did do things around the city and did uh, commissions and uh, so I think that's wonderful. That's, that's really great. Um, I think it was Dan who told me that someone who knew him back in the day basically said no one knew Gus Bauman. You know, even though he was around, but nobody really got to know the real Gus. Is that? Yes. Yeah. Well, I would add that I think that he had an impish spirit in there that would come out. He was part of the Pella and Chisel Club, and he certainly participated in their goofy skits. There are fabulous photographs of him. There's one with him with, I don't know if he's got a squirrel on his head, and he's dancing with his daughter at the White Sisters summer party. So he, he did, and then how can you not be an imp and do these marionettes and, and put in these spirits into these amazing toys? and. So I think there were so many sides to him we still don't understand. Well, that, you know, having, he, one of the things that attracts me to him was his sense, sense of humor. Uh, and there's always a joke lurking in there in, in many of his pieces. Um, can't remember, pardon? I don't know that story. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah. So he said Fremont Ellis was the one who said no one really knew Bauman. Yeah, but um, I, I just love that sense of humor that he has. And you know what? You need an audience to tell a joke. So in that sense... Um, oh, and his humor comes out in his manuscripts. I mean, he wrote A Still Life in Santa Fe. So I'm thinking a painting? As I read it, it's about his still and his, I think it was peach brandy and um, how we, there would be parties around his peach brandy and then uh, one night he gets a call that the man is in town. So he has to make all this liquor disappear, store it somewhere so it went under the house and in the process of hiding it, he kicked one and broke a bottle, so the whole house reeked <laughs> of it. And I mean, he just tells these amazing stories on himself. The car trip with the car breaking down and the tire flying over the car. He just was just such an amazing storyteller on himself.
thanks to Gayla, a most wonderful thing, will eventually join the Fry and Helaco Chavez History Library at the New Mexico History Museum, and that is the Bauman Archive. Thank you for that. <laughs> Which means that those papers will be available to, to researchers for ever. Um, so long as the History Museum's there, you could go there and study Bauman. This book is huge. It joins, it joins a huge number of scholarly articles in previous books and whatnot. How do you foresee those, those archives being used in the future? What's the unplowed ground that another researcher might look into? Well, we still need um, scholarship on his paintings, his drawings, his furniture, there's a book on his marionettes, but it would be lovely to have a book more like a Calig Raisonne of the marionettes. Um, his house could use a really great book on it. Uh, there's so much yet. Uh, the, he was a fabulous photographer. There are hundreds of brownie snapshots, and sometimes they relate to the, uh, the actual motif of the color woodcuts. So there's still so much to, to write upon and learn from all this huge amount of photos and, and papers. Nancy and Marty, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Well, Gayla knows that I want to write an article on Jane because I find Jane fascinating. So, um, Jane. <laughs> and you know, I, I think I think she was she was um, a. a as I said, I think she was a very warm person. I think she was an energetic person. I also think that I, she was a she was a career woman at a time when not a lot of women were. She was a, she had gone to Europe for dancing and theater, and um, and then she first came out here. She first came down here um, from Colorado to live in a pueblo and record um, Native American songs. And I think that she just had. I think there's so much more to tell about her, and it's, it's probably not a book, but it certainly is, she's certainly worth more attention, and so that's what I would like to do um, based on the research I've done so far. So that's, that's kind of my next project in terms of Bauman. And Marty, do you still have another project? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, I could, I could probably make one up. Well, I've always found it interesting. I mean, I suspect that up till now, we've really dealt with Bauman as an artist in the context of sort of art history. But actually, he was much more comfortable, at least when he was in Brown County, in the company of the other sort of craftsmen in town, the blacksmith or the wagon maker. And locally, his friends were really not in the artist colony. In fact, he loathed John Sloan, I think, or they didn't get along anyway. Uh, and, you know, he did have friends among the artists, but he also had friends in the community. So I think this, this would be the context to really understand him, is, you know, in what was this sort of small, untroubled world that he used to write about, which is how he described Santa Fe and why he settled here rather than other places that he had been. Uh, and I think that would give the true picture of, of him. Uh, you know those associations, um, and and I in in sort of just backtracking a little bit because Nancy Worth was talking about this today. She said when she would go to the Bauman house, he would disappear. So I mean it was he was very good friends with Nancy's parents, the John Gaumim and his wife. Uh, so you know this may talk a bit to his reclusivity that you know Jane was really the person who would greet people in the front room of the house uh, while Gus was out in the studio creating art Tom you already have another Bauman project in the works tell us about it two actually <laughs> um, go for it um, among the treasures that we collected at the at the history museum are a, a number of complete sets of blocks for two different books uh, that he planned and never completed. Um, the first one, uh, Indian Pottery Old and New, um, which he started printing in 1919, only did a few of the projected 50 uh, and then stopped. 
and then in the 30s went on and carved a whole other set of blocks to accompany that. But it still never got done. And then another book, um, which we will call Gust uh, Gustav Bauman's Saints of New Mexico, he was one of the first people, along with Mary Austin and Frank Applegate, um, to recognize uh, New Mexico um, religious uh, sculpture and painting as, as a folk art. And he saw this stuff being dispersed all over the country, and he wanted to document it somehow because it hadn't been documented. So he did it by drawing, not by taking photographs. Um, he did these wonderful renderings of actual pieces and then carved a set of blocks. Um, and then... Um, uh, in, fully intended to produce a book, he even had a, a, a manuscript by uh, Mary Austin written for it in an introduction, but it never got done. And it went to four different publishers, like Writer's Editions and the Grabhorn Press in San Francisco and Rydal Press. All these different pr presses were going to print it, and it never got done. Well, we've co co uh, collected all the elements, and that we're going to print the book from the blocks, so. That's wonderful. Yeah.